Good morning. How are y'all doing? Good. Good. Welcome to Prime Time. Prime Time is designed to celebrate the experience and accomplishments of Bethel faculty, students, and staff. It is a collaborative project between the Friends of the BU Library, faculty development, and other offices on campus. We record most of our programming, and you can find the recordings in the BU Digital Library. I'll give you an announcement about next Tuesday, next Tuesday, November 8th, after you vote. Join us when Amy Larry White, Professor of Social Work, presents Overcoming Colorblindness on the Path to Beloved Community that utilizes critical race theory as a framework for teaching strategies that transcend colorblindness. Today we have an Edgren Scholars presentation. The Edgren Scholars program is named after John Alexis Edgren, the founder of what is now Bethel. One of the key educational principles that Edgren articulated in the 19th century was that the relation between teachers and pupils shall not be that of commander and subject, but one of true friendship and helpfulness. It is in this spirit that we establish the Edwin Scholars Program in order to encourage and facilitate students and faculty working together. So today, we're wel we welcome Edwin Scholars Dr. Peggy Kendall, Professor of Communication Studies, and Krista Jolivet, Krista Jolivet Senior in Communication Studies, as they share their research on the role of fictive kinship and social support from family members within the job of the home health aid. Join me in welcoming them. So I think we got you guys, right? Thank you. Well, thank you for being here. That's nice. And thank you. Um, well, okay, so for the first part of my family's life, we had, uh, professional direct care workers in our home. Uh, we had a child who had a lot of medical issues and um, the, the women that would come in, there were nurses, therapists, and mostly PCAs. Um, not only did they care for my son, but they, um, they cared for us. Now, some of them, I have to admit, some of them were a little grumpy, some were very professional, some were a little cold, some were uh, a little untrustworthy, but for the most part, these women that came into our home became part of our family. And um, they cared for my son, but by doing that, they allowed me a chance to breathe. So, you know, I, it, you can be, become very isolated in that kind of situation. It allowed me to go to the grocery store. Uh, these women would sit and talk with me and train me how to do things and <laughs> tell me it would be okay and um, help me figure out, you know, is he really sick? Should he go to the ER? Should he go to the doctor? Or is it just a cold? Uh, those kinds of things had an impact on my whole family. Uh, and it had a huge impact on me um, at that point in my life. All that to say, when I met with a colleague about a year ago, and she said she was doing research into home health aides, I thought, I got to do that. Um, that was such an important part of my life. These women, um, and some men, um, have these jobs that tend to be low status. They tend to be, uh, don't get a lot of training. Um, in a lot of ways, they don't get a lot of respect. But these women make a huge difference in people's lives. Now, home health aides are a little bit different than the PCAs that I work with. Um, uh, home health aides tend to work with uh, elderly clients, helping them, um, helping keep them in their homes. So, uh, I was working on this project for uh, about a year before uh, with a, a colleague of mine from Winona State University. Uh, and then when, when Chris and I were traveling through Europe, I realized what a creative thinker she was. And one of the things about this sort of methodology is you have to be creative. This whole uh, grounded theory thing is, is very fun and playful and um, you, you need creative thinkers. So Krista was the perfect person to do that. So this summer we worked hard on this. Uh, we did present uh, one time this summer on a whole nother topic. That's one of the things about building a data set like this. There's so many different kinds of questions you can ask. Um, and that was so helpful uh, that we decided we we're gonna present on a different topic uh, so that we can get people's feedback and questions because that was really formative in what we did with the last project. So today we're gonna look at family roles, fictive kinship. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit of review of the literature, what's out there. 
Uh, and then we're going to talk about Brahma theory as a methodology and then some of the results that we have. And hopefully, as we go, you can start um, thinking about some questions uh, because that's the thing with grounded theory. It's very formative. And as we think through things and see things from a new perspective, we're able to, to ask different kinds of questions. So go for it. Awesome. So as I was introduced, I'm Krista, and I'm a senior relational communication studies major graduating in December. And I've really enjoyed working with Peggy on grounded theory research. Uh, I've learned probably double what you'll hear today. So first, um, this is kind of the so what of the study. Um, studying home health aids beyond the personal stories, um, as Peggy was sharing, it's important because there have been large demographic changes in the aging population, even here in Minnesota, over the past few decades. So there's a graph that shows an increase from 1950 and then to 2013, and then a projected increase in the percentage and in actual numbers of people in Minnesota who are above the age of 65. And that's a really great thing because people are living longer and um, their quality of life is increasing. Um, but it can also pose a challenge because there aren't as many people to support them in this profession. So here you see a map and the darker the blue, the higher the percentage of elderly population over the age of 65. Um, and 65 still seems young to me, so, um, but it's definitely increasing and even around the Twin Cities area, um, the projected increase in 20 more years is going to be much higher. So the need for these home health aids is going to be greater because home health aids do more than just um, physical labor. They also keep elderly people in their homes and that's where elderly people thrive is when they're in um, the place that they're used to. They're not in a foreign location. Um, they can still go about their daily life with just a little bit of help um, and they are um, more satisfied both physically and emotionally. So as Peggy was saying, um, this study also provides more of a voice to these home health aides who are remote, low status workers. And what that means is that they're remote and that they go into people's homes who they don't know and they're without a supervisor. They're just working on their own. So we had many interviewers who would say, um, I just knock on their door and see if they're home and I walk in and see what I need to do. So um, they really don't have much direction in that regard and they're low status. Um, they're not paid very much for the amount of labor that they do. And we will be practicing grounded theory and show, showing you what we um, developed. So, I think this is back to the challenges of being on health aid. Did you want me to talk more on this? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> um, there are many challenges. Um, <laughs> and we have this little circle diagram. So at the top, we have low wages, um, which is pretty self-explanatory. Um, they're not paying enough for the amount of physical and emotional labor. And there's some burnout that goes along with that. Um, perfect. Um, and if we could just, um, <laughs> a, a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, these people are, you know, the frontline workers, they're the ones that are going to help us survive and thrive this demographic change, yet um, they get minimum wage. These are people in uh, working with uh, elderly clients in their homes. They get minimum wage. Uh, the training, you have to have a high school diploma, and they'll get um, a couple of hours of training, but for the mo most part, they go in and they're on their own. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, that's kind of a problem. Uh, and, and many of them feel like they wish that they had more training in not, not just the, the medical piece, but also some of the psychosocial things that happen um, in someone's home. I think they're, uh, I wouldn't say that they're as low status here as they are in other parts of the country, but they are considered low status workers because uh, these, these people have no benefits. Uh, they are, many of them live just right on the verge of the poverty line, even when they're working full time. Uh, they have to use their own vehicle to get from place to place, and they're usually not reimbursed for um, mileage. Uh, and many of these workers are recent immigrants, are uh, um, single moms, uh, but yet they, they stay in this profession because it's so important. Um, 
Oh, one of the other challenges has to do with turnover rate as well. Um, and not only is it hard for them when, uh, you know, a number of people might be working with the same client and then um, the people that they're working with, uh, they come in after or before, they, they keep changing. But, but I have to say, one of the pieces I heard over and over again um, <coughs> that we both did that, um, they would be in someone's home and the agency would say, there's no one, we can't, you know, someone just called and quit and there's no one to take care of this person. So what is this person, the home health thing gonna do, you know? And they feel a real responsibility to this person. So that high turnover rate is hard on both the client and uh, the home health aid. Uh, and a lot of this does lead eventually uh, to burnout. There's quite a, quite a bit of literature on burnout in the healthcare professions. Uh, not a ton on uh, these uh, home health aides or direct care workers. Um, in fact, a lot of the research done on these these kinds of positions are done on um, like nursing assistants, CNAs, and most of them work in a nursing home. And you can kind of tell a nursing home would be really different. Working in a nursing home, you know, going from, from room to room with your su supervisor uh, breathing down your back is very different than being in someone's home by yourself. Um, so a lot of the burnout literature talks about a couple of things, and these things in particular seem just to, to match perfectly with some of the things that we were hearing in our interviews. Uh, so for instance, um, the first one is something called role ambiguity, which is very stressful for people. And role ambiguity is sort of like, um, I go in, I know this is who I am, this is what I'm supposed to do. And the client, so, because the agency tells you, this is your job, this is what you're supposed to do. But then the client says, oh, could you, could you also do the laundry? And, and my son just brought some laundry too, could you do his? And so all of a sudden, well, wait, is that my role or isn't it? And then, and then a family member comes in and says, no, you're not doing that right. Um, and then you've got like four different people telling you um, what kind of job you're supposed to do, who you're supposed to be. And then you go from client to client and each one is a little bit different. So your role, how you're supposed to do your role, you get so many competing messages and it gets to be stressful. You know, what, what am I supposed to do with this job? Uh, so, uh, oh, this particular uh, um, quote, I think, talks about this well. It's inconsistent and uncertain signals about present requirements, future events, and evaluation by significant others. And we had a number of times when, um, you know, it, it took a while in these interviews, but eventually they began to trust us enough to say, you know, there's things that we, we do that we know we would get in trouble with the agency if we did, but they have to be done, you know. Um, so uh, you're not supposed to give your phone number to the client, but almost all of them did. And a lot of times these clients would call them when these <coughs> feeds were at home. And, um, so that kind of, you know, who, who's the boss here? Who, who, who's evaluating me? Who could get me into trouble? Those kinds of things. Uh, one of the other ones that was uh, particularly important has to do with this idea of role conflict. And role conflict is, I have an idea of what a good home health aide is supposed to do, but I can't do it. I, I'm not allowed to do that. So I think a good home health aide is really committed to these people, but yet things happen and um, I can't you know, share my phone number or, or think other things come up and it's like, I, there's too much work to do. There's too many, I don't have enough hours. I don't have enough money to pay me. Or, or these people are like putting these extra things on me and it's like, I know how I want it to be done, but I just can't do it because of structure or work overload or some of those kinds of things. So it's when the role expectations are mutually incompatible with the individual's own values and beliefs about what is appropriate in the role. So a good home health aide does this, but yet I, no matter how many hours I work, no matter how hard I work, I just, I can never get that. I can never be there. That's stressful. Um, so those two things in particular, um, here, here's another, and I think this really talks about some of the workload issues as well. Uh, one author says, on one hand, these age or direct workers are instructed to maintain only a professional association with clients. On the other hand, the greatest reward for many of the workers is the human contact and emotional attachment they gain from the job. In other words, they love becoming friends with their clients. You know? 
And effectively, the context and conditions of their work are ideally suited to extracting labor that exceeds their officially defined jobs. I mean, that's how the whole thing is set up. Um, this is what you're supposed to be. This is what you want to be. And it, you know, the, there's a big gap. Um, and then you have things like lack of autonomy. Uh, very, uh, and we're going to talk about some of that, how you don't have choices as many. Um, you, you can't do what you think is right, necessarily. Uh, and work overload. Uh, these women um, mostly, we only interviewed one man, and he was a high school student that <laughs> had been working for a week and a half. So he was interesting. But, um, <laughs> Uh, but for the most part, these women um, are working a huge number of hours, uh, sometimes getting paid, sometimes not getting paid for it. And the consequences of burnout are really important. And this, this is true for any kind of helping profession. When you start to feel burned out, one of the things is that you're just emotionally exhausted. You can't deal with these, these emotional things that come up. Um, and that's going to cross over to your family and a lot of um, other parts of your life. You also get this depersonalization. And I don't know if you've ever been, um, this happens a lot in nursing homes. If you've ever been in a nursing home, um, now some nursing homes are awesome, um, but sometimes you can just hear the way that um, workers talk to the clients. And sometimes they're just like, they're like machines. You know, they, they whip them around, they change the bed, um, they don't see the person, right? And a lot of that is due to this burnout. You know, I just can't build one more relationship. I can't handle it. Uh, and so you end up treating people like a job instead of like a person. Uh, and then they don't do as good of a job. You know, eventually uh, a lot of these women who get burned out uh, say that they, they, they just can't be as good of a home health aide as they want to be. Um, so then the question is, so why would they do this job? They get paid squat, you know. Uh, the the ability for them to get, you know, kind of build into, uh, be promoted to other jobs is pretty small. Um, let's face it, they're doing some jobs that are not that pretty. Uh, they talk a lot about butt wiping and you know those kinds of things. So these toileting sorts of things, um, these personal intimate things that people don't like to do. So why on earth? Do these people do this job? There, there's really no good logical reason. Well, part of uh, almost every single home health aide we talk to, and this is throughout, throughout the literature, they feel called to do this. This is important to them. They feel like they're making a difference. So um, calling is really important. They, they feel like a good home health aide is making a difference in these people's lives, um, and these, these people are making a difference in my life. So, it's significant. The work they do is significant. Now, what's really interesting, and I found some of these things in um, research that was totally unrelated to um, home health aides and um, healthcare workers. Um, but one of the things that happens, especially when you have a low status job, um, let's say, uh, let's say a, a garbage collector, right? Or I don't know what you'd call a garbage collector, but. Um, and it's kind of a low status job. Uh, so how can you feel good about yourself when you have that job? Well, one of the things that you do is you tell yourself and you co-create this idea of a good person. You know, I am making a difference. So one of the things that happens, I think, with home health aides is the reason that they keep doing this is because they're able to co-create with the person, this is important. I'm doing important things, I'm a good person, um, and therefore I, I can put up with some of the yucky parts of the job. Um, and this is, uh, uh, according to Kleinman, this is called something a moral identity. They are co-creating this moral identity. And as long as I'm feeling like I'm doing something good, I can put up with a lot of yucky stuff. So, that's that. And then we came across one final line of really interesting things that applies here. And that has to do with social support. There's a whole area of social support in the communication discipline. Um, and basically, uh, social support is when someone feels like what they're doing, it, people appreciate what they're doing, basically. So it's the expression of positive affect. You know, I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, you do that really well. Oh, my, my father really. 
um, you're helping him stay in his home. I, I really cares about you. Thank you so much. Um, affirmation or endorsement of another person's behaviors, perceptions, or expressed views. Um, you know, you're really good at this. What What would you do? You know, what do you think my, my dad needs to do? You know, do you think this this is an infection? Um, so asking their opinion. You know, accepting the fact that this is, uh, you, you're good at this, and you seem to know things, and therefore um, I'm going to kind of affirm those, that information. And finally, helping people out. That's social support. So those three things together help um, people with burnout. They help people stay in jobs that are difficult, um, high-stress sorts of jobs. So that's kind of where we started from. So then we developed this big research question, and it's actually not that scientific to read. It says, <laughs> how do families provide either stress or support or both to home health aides? And we found a lot of things. And we utilized, do I use this arrow? Perfect. Um, we utilized grounded theory, like I was saying earlier. And grounded theory is, um, it's not like a universal theory that applies to every situation always, like you hear about some theories. Um, but it's developed by Strauss and Corbin, and it says the non-mathematical, mm, love that, process of interpretation <laughs> carried out for the purpose of discovering concepts and relationships in raw data, in this case that would be the words from the interviews, and then organizing them into a theoretical explanatory theme. Um, so we literally built this data set from the ground up, starting with interview one and um, recording all of the words that we listened to and then analyzing those words into different groups of themes, patterns, what we saw about family relationships, etc. So the process, we explained to you a lot of the results and things that we're going from, but how the heck did we do all this? First, we developed the questions, and we started with a set of probably 12 or 13 questions um, that were pretty broad. Um, and so things like, why did you become a home health aide? What do you like about being a home health aide? What's stressful? Um, what do you not enjoy? What do you wish would change? And then as we heard some responses that would repeat, so we would hear a lot of people say, well, sometimes it's stressful to work with family members. Then we said, aha, okay, what else can we ask? So what types of family members do you work with? And then we added questions such as, um, do you like working with family members? Um, give us an example of a time where you worked with a family member that was difficult. Um, so then we conducted the actual interviews, and usually it took place in a neutral location like Caribou, which I also loved. Um, <laughs> and we would meet, and usually they lasted for about a half hour to 40 minutes. Um, and after that, I um, conducted these transcriptions. And that involved um, taking the recordings of the interviews, putting them on the computer, and then actually typing out all of the words and phrases that were used um, word for word. So each transcription, so about a half hour of real time, takes about uh, four or five hours to transcribe. Um, and so this was the part where um, it got a little redundant, but this was a way in which you can keep those recordings and then um, look back on the words that were actually said and then start to notice these patterns. And then from those patterns, we did something that's called coding. And there's a few different types of coding that we used. Um, it's not as mathematical as it sounds, but it still is really interesting. So we'll go into that. And from that coding, you start to develop this theory. So grounded theory, literally taking things from the ground and building them up and then seeing what we have. So um, there's three different types of coding. Um, one is called open coding, um, and that involves microanalysis, which we'll touch on. The second is axial coding. And then the third is developing that theory creation. In this case, it was regarding home health aides and then family members of clients. So this is a picture of what it looks like to utilize open coding. And it's kind of a lot. So over here on the left is a list of files that we coded. So we depersonalized them, took names and um, personal information away, and just labeled them. And then here are the actual words from the interview. Um, so it says another example would be a lady who had surgery. So she's telling us this story about one of her clients who had surgery. Um, and then on the right you see different colored stripes. So there's purple, red, 
um, kind of a bluish green and blue. Um, and those colors represent different themes that we came across. So the purple says boundaries. She's talking about boundaries. Um, the red is compliance gaining, and that's kind of what we presented on this summer. Um, then there's also emotional labor is the green stripe. And then she's also referencing her relationships with clients. So we came up and we coded um, each separate interview, and we're able to group things. And we noticed this emerging pattern of home health aides who would talk about relationships with family members. So that's open coding. Then there's microanalysis. Did you want to touch on this, Penny? This is, it's not too bad. I'll take you through bubble by bubble. Um, so microanalysis is pretty much the little questions that you ask about the details in transcription. So things like, like who are they talking about? Who, what, when, where, why? Um, you think of the meaning of certain words. So what does it mean that they're stressed? Or why are they saying, yeah, that was stressful? Does it mean that they were exhausted by it? Does it mean it was challenging? Um, you think of certain rules that they use. Um, rules about how they construct their identity or their moral identity, um, rules about their job. Then you look at keywords and key phrases, and we'll see a word cloud in a few minutes with a lot of those. And then you look at comparisons or flip-flops or red flags. So we'll go through a quote with some words that popped out at us, and we said, well, what does that mean? So here's an example. So this Abe was saying, well, if the family tells me to do something, but the client wants me to do something else, and the office wants me to do something else, then I'll call the office. So stop right there. In the first line, she says, if the family tells, but the client and the agency want. This is going back to that rule ambiguity and that rule conflict of like what's happening. Um, the family is physically telling me to do something, but I know that the agency I work for would want otherwise. So that was kind of a red flag that popped out at us. Um, so I'll call the office and I'll say, okay, then what? And especially if the client wants something completely different, um, so back to the office, why are you calling the office? Why aren't you referencing a specific person, like a supervisor or a colleague or a coworker? Um, this was a theme that I found a lot. They would refer to the agency as an inanimate object, um, so they wouldn't talk directly about their supervisors. They didn't really have solid relationships with the people that they worked for. So it became more of, I'll call the office, or I'll call the agency. Um, so I'll sit down with the family and I'll say, okay, your mama wants me to do this. You don't think I should do that. So I try to get them to do some sort of, yeah, that client has to wait, but yeah, I feel like I have to have a relationship with the family as well as the client because I have to work with them too, but they're not my boss. So this word stuck out to us because we said, hmm, boss, you were just talking about the office that you work for, the agency that you work for. So who is the actual boss in this case? Um, who decides? Do you decide who the boss is as the home health aide, or has it been decided for you? Um, what's the opposite of a boss? A servant or a follower, really? Um, and so what does that make the home health aide? Do they have any power in this role? Are they the boss? Can they tell their client what to do? So there's all these sorts of questions that emerge. Um, and so I feel like they're, you know, they're the ones contacting the agency again. But if my client has, you know, well, they know what they want, then I answer to them. So this is that whole idea of the relationship. Um, and in this case, having a relationship with the family can sometimes look like the family is the boss. And so who are they actually listen, listening to? This, there's a lot of conflict of interest sometimes. Um, so then there's something called axial coding. Um, and it looks a little bit different. If you remember, this was the open coding. Um, and so that was looking at the direct transcriptions. And from that, we can develop something called axial coding. Um, and I think Peggy created this beautiful yes, and brightly colored diagram. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so at the top, there's a big circle that says relationships. Um, and this is very intriguing to us because there's different characteristics that go along with these. Um, and we won't go too much in, in depth um, into all of these, but we came up with different types of relationships that you can compare home health aides and their clients to. Um, so there's the slave, the parent-child relationship, friend relationship, which kind of goes into fictive kinship. Um, so that was another type of coding. And axial coding can also <coughs> include word clouds. And these were really a fun activity to do. 
because you take all of the most frequently used words um, and you come up with themes. And so at the center of this is family. You also see words like really or you know or <laughs> phrases that are used frequently by Minnesotans. Um, and so family emerged as a prominent theme, which I don't know if we expected at the beginning. Um, we didn't really come into it with a lot of preconceived notions, um, but have had experiences. So, um, so let me just yeah. say a, a couple of things about this whole grounded theory thing. Um, it, it's built on the premise that the data needs to speak for itself. And you know, a lot of times when we do social science, we have an idea, we have a hypothesis, we have a theory, and then we, we put that on top of the data and see if it fits. Um, and a lot of ways you miss, you might miss really important things going on in the data. So this really is all about letting the data speak and, and it, it's also based on this idea that language matters and how the words that we use matter. Uh, and you know when we're, and I haven't done a lot of grounded theory before this, um, and as we were getting all these um, interviews it's like, wow, I don't know if there's anything there, it's like, it's like duh, you know. But, but when you have these words um, and you have it all laid out, you can go in there and at least once a week, twice a week, Chris and I would do some of this microanalysis and we'd take a section and we'd be like, why is that? Why did they say, why did they use that word? What, you know, what, what's motivating them there? Why didn't they use this word or that word? And so by kind of processing through, then we would change some of the coding and then we'd find different relationships in the coding. Um, and then we'd go back and change some of the interview questions, and then we'd come back and do some microanalysis. And it's this very formative process where the more that we <coughs> talked and we brainstormed and we did all sorts of really colorful things, I think, that's definitely one of Chris's um, positive features. Uh, <laughs> and um, so that's when we began to see some really interesting things that, like Chris has said, I, I'm, we didn't start off with some of these things. Uh, and they really uh, began to, especially the family thing, I never would have thought, um, but right away in, one of the, in some of the first um, interviews we did, uh, we said, well, what don't you like about your job? I like everything except the families. And it's like, wow, you know? And, and there's nothing written about that in the literature, especially with home health aids. So, some of our results. So, the research question that we referenced was, how do families provide support and stress, or both, to home health aides? We came up with different roles that family members play. Um, whether they know it or not, family members do have an impact on the job of the home health aide, even if they never make contact. So um, there's roles that devalue the client or the family member that they're working with. There's <coughs> roles that devalue the aide themselves and the work that they're doing. And then on the positive side, there's um, roles that value the aid, and that's where the fictive kinship comes into play. Um, so first, the roles that devalue the client. There's the avoider, and these were um, roles that we came up with and named ourselves. Um, so then there's the burnt out absentee, and then the family feuder. So each of these has a quote from one of the transcriptions that accompanies it. So there's the avoider. So this person, um, this family member, sometimes they're there, but a lot of them just avoid being there when the aide is there. Some of them will just leave and then come back when we're done. So they just don't want to be there um, for some reason or another. Maybe they've had awkward experiences, um, but this increases the role conflict. Then there's the burnt out absentee. So this family member, I have met him one time and he just, he just pays for all of her care, but he's not there emotionally supportive or anything like that. So this family member is kind of just tired of dealing with all of the, all of the medical issues and expenses um, and removes themselves emotionally. And that's more role conflict because then the aide says, well, who's actually going to be here for my client? There's no one here to support them. Then there's the family feuder. And this person um, said, you've got all these scenarios going on and family dynamics, especially if it's a family that has 10 kids and you've got them all over. So all these kids are like, no, we should do this with mom or dad, or this is what we should do, this is the next step. And the home health aide says, like, I can't take sides, I can't do anything. So they feel powerless and it goes along with that role and the youth. So then there's roles that devalue the aid and the work that they're doing. So there's the lazy live-in, the family excluder, 
and the micromanager. So the lazy limit. This is a quote. What's confusing for me is when a particular client or patient has other family members living in the home that are contributing, and I wonder why they're not participating and contributing to their care. And therefore, you know, there's no participatory role, so we end up doing everything. So if there's a spouse or a child living in the home, and like Peggy was saying earlier, they might say, well, can you do his laundry too? Or um, will you take care of him too? That kind of goes along with the lack of autonomy um, and the work overload. It ends up piling up more. Then there's the family excluder. Um, and this gets difficult with boundaries. So after the home health aide has um, finished his or her work with a client, um, the client might be put into hospice and actually might pass away. And then the family totally cuts off the relationship. They just don't want anything else to do. Um, and so the role conflict becomes perfect. So then there's the micromanager. That's pretty self-explanatory. So then we come into fictive kinship. And these are the positive virtues. So valuing the A, there's the respecter family member, the co-worker, and then the fictive kin. Do you want to go over yeah. And um, yeah. So uh, somehow we ran out of time. Uh, <laughs> but what these what these do really is they're providing the, the positive social support that the families provide really helps the home health aid develop this uh, co-create this moral identity. This I'm doing a good job, and it not only just makes your job easier, it's key to keeping them in their position. Uh, that's why the, these families, when they devalue the client or the, um, the aid, uh, it really adds just exponentially to the, the burnout and the stress level. So a couple of uh, other things that we've looked at, um, uh, my colleague has done interviews in New York, uh, and there's some very stark differences between New York, uh, New York City home health aides and uh, the aides that we talked with. Um, we have uh, an article that we've submitted that talks about compliance gaining, how they uh, get their clients to do things. Uh, and one of the things that we're really looking at is um, some of this emotional labor. Uh, it's hard being there for clients, especially when the clients aren't necessarily always nice. Uh, so those are some of the other things. And we've got this data set, and we're adding to the data set. And um, I don't know, it's a fun, exciting sort of thing to do. And we have 25 seconds for <laughs> questions. <laughs> All right. Oh, I see that hand. I'm always interested in like a collaborative project like yeah. this where your data is a little more qualitative. For like the open coding, did you sit down and like go through the first couple transcripts together and make sure I call this emotional labor, would you say so too? So and then did you eventually like split up and divide the transcripts or I'm always curious to know about that. Yes. Okay. That's exactly. <laughs> yeah. The software we do actually allows us to we would both code it and then it would compare the two. Oh. Uh, and we could see the uh, the different codes that were a little bit iffy and then we talked through those. Yeah, that's a good question. Is that a pointing or is no. that a question? A oh. <laughs> this, uh, this is a great example of digital scholarship. Uh, and I was wondering what you found the most surprising about using kind of these more qualitative tools to do this type of analysis. Did you find anything surprising, difficult, exciting? Uh, I'll be honest, it took us a month to figure that stupid program out. <laughs> it was so complicated. Yeah. But once we got it, I mean, yeah, we're pretty good at it now. We'll go <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I want to use it in senior STEM um, next semester, but um, the learning curve of that thing is, is really hard. And it, I don't know. Which program did you use? You didn't use Atlas? Yeah. No, in Google. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
thank you so very much for coming.